started. <clears throat> Greetings from Berkeley, California. I'm thrilled to be a moderator for this very long overdue talk on the politics of the Thai judiciary by Ajahn Kim Tong, Ton Sakun Rung Rung, with a response by Ajahn Penjan Pobarisut. My name is Titi Jampajon Giat, a PhD candidate in South and Southeast Asian Studies at UC Berkeley and the academic chair of the US-based Association for Thai Democracy or ATD. I wish to thank the Center for Southeast Asia Studies for agreeing to host this event out of solidarity. This talk is the latest in the lecture series on contemporary Thai politics organized by the ATD and the Center. The recordings of all the previous talks, including this one, can be accessed through the Center YouTube channel, which will be posted in the chat box. A little bit of review of the talks we have organized. We kicked off our series with a lecture on Thai Republicanism by Professor Patrick Jory, with a response by Professor Alexandro Claudio, then a conversation on Thai democratic struggles between Thanathorn Jingdung Rungkit and Aitim Parit Wachara Sintu, a theoretical and historical discussion of Thai royal capitalism by Ajahn Puang Chon Unjanam, with a response by Professor Andrew Johnson, and lastly, a dialogue on Thai queer and feminist movements against dictatorship between Raptor Sirapop Atohi and Professor Tamara Luz. In the past few lectures, we tackle different aspects of contemporary Thai politics, and we try to balance between academic perspectives, mainly history, political science, and anthropology, and those of the political actors, both affiliated with political parties and the youth movement. We also tried to balance out institution, nationality, and gender, and we still have to work more on the latter. This time, we are diving into the belly of the beast, namely the avenues of the judicial and the, sorry, and the juridical, which are constitutive of the Thai state. I personally cannot find anyone who is more ideal to discuss such an intersection between law and politics in Thailand, besides this young and rising scholar working at Chulalongkorn University, the bastion of royalism and conservatism. Obviously, he aims to transform the system from within. Let me start introducing our speaker, Ajahn Kim Tong Ton Sekun Rung Rung, by saying that he just recently changed his professional appointment from the Faculty of Law to the Faculty of Political Science. I think this shift is already a very interesting political statement. At Chulalongkorn University, Kim Tong lectures on constitutional law and jurisprudence. He studied LLB at Chulalongkorn University before earning his LLM at Yale Law School and PhD at the University of Bristol. He wrote his dissertation, interestingly, on Buddhist constitutionalism in Thai legal system. He works extensively on judicial politics, especially that of the constitutional law and its role in legitimizing illiberal constitutionalism into the Thai constitutional system. He has published book chapters and articles on this topic with Cambridge University Press, Routledge, and Journal of Contemporary Asia. This talk is structured as the following. Ajahn Kim Tong will present for 45 minutes, followed by Ajahn Pinjan's response for 10 minutes. Then we open the floor up for Q&A until the event ends. During and after the talk, feel free to post your questions or comments in the separate Q&A box. Please also specify your current affiliation in your post. Ajahn Kim Tong, now the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Kun Titi. It's my pleasure to be here and, and speak to you all. Well, uh, I guess I am at the crossroad um, professionally, at least. Uh, we are talking about judges at war today and, and the topic is very apt. More recently, um, the more I discuss about Thai politics, it all lead back to one thing, that is law and, and judges. I mean, it, it becomes unavoidable to, to discuss about this topic, the judicial roles in, in Thai political crisis. However, um, the subject itself is also at the crossroad and everyone seemed to be abandoned it. Uh, you talk to people in the law school and, and they said, this is something that uh, beyond normal law. So 
it's something too political to be discussed in the law school. And in the school of political science, uh, pretty much people say it's too technical, too specialized in law that they, they don't discuss it either. So, so at the, as a result, I think uh, the, the topic of uh, judicial politics is uh, largely been uh, understudy. But today I, I will try to give you some, a glimpse into what it is and, and why it is. Uh, so to begin with, I think it's important, there's a few important notes that I want to begin with and, and everyone should bear in mind. First is that the judiciary has always been among the most trusted public institutions for many years. In King Prachatipok's public surveys of like, uh, trust in public institution, the court of justice often come like top of the rank, number one, like the most trusted. I, I think it's very telling that an unelected uh, body uh, always have a higher, have higher score than, than elected body. You get court of justice, then administrative court and, and constitutional court, and then you get the government. Ranking like the lowest would be, uh, I mean, you can guess, I think if you know Thailand pretty well, I mean, politicians, MPs and, and police, I mean, police is like come very, very last. A anyhow, uh, at the same time, I think it is being accused of meddling with politics and scenes of protest that would be unimaginable a few years ago and now very common. Last year, you see, uh, Benja Apan Yang Thai activist shouting in like to the face of that particular judge that he's he is like delivering injustice to her friends. And, and this scene is unimaginable a few years ago, but now people think it's a norm. So people share information of judges' names and family members. I personally uh, do not support wish hunt, but you have to admit that uh in some cases, I mean, you understand why social, they try social sanction, uh, desperate out of other legal recourse. And, right? So it's indicate something, an ill effect of lawfare, you know, uh, the use of law as a political weapon, the effect of lawfare on, on the institution. And, and the above juxtaposition tells us two things. First, um, I think when we talk about Thai judiciary, actually we are, the caveat is that we are talking about two different courts most, most of the time. I mean, both of them will be addressed today, but uh, the first one is constitutional court and the second one is the court of justice. So they are two separate entities. I will address both of them, but you have to bear in mind that uh, they have different background, they have different reputations. Uh, usually, I mean, my, my former works will focus on constitutional court because there's like all the mega political case happening. But more recently, my, my interest shifted to the court of justice because uh, that's where a lot of cases about Thai activists are taking place too. And, and, and somehow it's more general, I mean, I will explain about this later, but just bear in mind, we are talking about different courts all the time. That case go to constitutional court. That case go to court of justice. Just bear that. And second thing is I want to point out is that uh, within the court of justice, what we are looking at is a, is a parallel universe in the court, in the same court. You have that court that... Uh, decide cases, ordinary cases, uh, contracts, thoughts, and, and all other things quite professionally, uh, quite impressive. I mean, if, if you come to Thailand, if you do business in Thailand, you, you ask if my contract will be enforced, will be fairly enforced in, in case I have a dispute, I would say yes. Uh, if you have a private dispute, the court gonna be your great, of your great help. But uh, there's also a parallel universe in the very same court. If you get charged with some political charges, 
your life will be very, very difficult. And, and you have to somehow, you have to try to explain that kind of parallel, parallel universe within the court. Why certain set of cases will be professionally adjudicated and another uh, set of cases would be handled unfairly. And that's by the same court. So, so, so there's normal business and the state of exception but in this case, I mean, both business as normal and state of exception coexist at the same time. Right. So uh, there, there used to be that separation state of exception and, and normal business. But, but I would like to say that uh, recently, I think this separation between political court and legal court or law court is crumbling down amidst growing politicization of judiciary in Thailand. So in my talk, I'm trying to introduce to the audience who the judiciary is, in particular, who the judges are. I mean, we tend to think of the institution, the court as an institution, but in Thai, when we say San, it could refer to the court, the judiciary, or judges as well, and I think, Judges is the least understood part of what we call court in Thailand. I'll try to explain as, as brief as possible as time allow uh, why they do that. Why they are leaning toward conservative or royalist camp, why? Uh, and, and I will try, I mean, so highly, uh, I think it will be very futile, but I have to try uh, talking about the recourse and the possible remedies to this issue. Okay. So what do they do? What do courts do? Uh, it's all encapsulated very well in the term lawfare, the use of uh, court and law as political weapon, usually against democratic activists. But I will focus, there are like four separate courts in Thailand, or maybe 3.5. It depends on how you think about the last one. Uh, the first one is the Court of Justice. The second one is the Court of the Constitutional Court. The third would be Administrative Court, which I will be, ex I will exclude it from, from our talk today. It has its own set of problem, but, but not for today. Uh, and, and the last one would be military court. Uh, so it could be four courts in Thailand or 3.5 if you discount uh, the military court anyway. I, 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 I don't think they are like uh, operate as a professional and trustworthy institution. Uh, I mean, military justice in Thailand, but uh, depend on your view. But let's talk about the constitutional court for a moment. I mean, for, for many years, I would say since 2005, 2006, I mean, shortly prior to the, to the 2006 coup, I mean, the constitutional court was in like spotlight and, and has been there ever since. It has delivered many, what we call mega political cases. So a case of high political importance. Uh, latest would be the ruling on on, on Thai protest, Thai, Thai protest and the call for monarchical reform, saying that that amounts to overthrow, overthrowing of the government you know, that's in breach of the constitution. But before that, you, you have like, this solution of future forward. I heard Kun Hanathorn have talked here, so you, you know him and you know what future forward is. It's a maverick opposition party in the court. This, this solved it. And that this solution led to that huge protest later. But there are several uh, dissolutions uh, cracking down on Thaksin's camp, as well as several decisions that endorsed and legitimized Prayut's camp. Uh, the one I remember quite vividly is, is about Prayut's taking oath. Yeah, he, he, he took an incomplete or he dropped the allegiance to the constitution and he remained only the allegiance to the monarchy, if I remember correctly. However, uh, the court said that that's, the oath is a matter between the king and Prayut. So even if 
but you didn't complete the oath that's like the court wouldn't gonna step in Some, something like that so uh and many more uh, the court uphold less majesty as constitutional so all seems very biased and 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 that has occupied our interest in judicial politics for years but <clears throat> beginning in 2020 uh, uh, the court of justice came into my attention it handled criminal cases against protest leaders <clears throat> less majesty capital crime sedition <clears throat> emergency law and and so on so records from litigator and relative expose the hidden world that uh, we, we, we rarely pay attention to. I mean, when criminal cases happen, usually it's the lit litigator that experience it firsthand. And, and usually like, the public pay little attention to, to the detail of, of the courtroom. But since this is like, a public case and a lot of attention, so even minute details are shared, what, the, what a judge says to the defendant, what, um, how they are beat, beaten in front of the judges, for example. Uh, so great detail of injustice are shared online. And, and uh, records suggest that the court is prejudiced against liberal democracy and judges categorically show indifference to police brutality and unlawful detention, as well as uh, like the correctional department's deprivation of rights to legal counsel. Judges deny uh, these protest leaders a bail, which is in breach of the constitutionally guaranteed presumption of innocence. The latest uh, report that I read, uh, a judge called a litigator a litigator has to obtain his uh, legal license in like lawyer license in in order to be able to present the case in the court and and the judge just called this guy saying that you know that uh, the Thai lawyer association is under a royal patronage and so he implies that by representing a case for for defendant of less majesty is an act of disloyal and that's something that uh, the judge refused to, to record all this conversation into like his transcript, the court transcript. So it won't be, it won't be shown anywhere. It's just told on the internet. And, and if there were there not Facebook, uh, I wouldn't be able to read it. And, and this just gone into a very anecdotal tales that many years later, someone would tell me. But, but the thing is, uh, there's a lot of bias. There's a lot of prejudice. And of course, when you have bias and prejudice, you have impartiality and injustice as well, right? And the, the, the situation sometimes become very dire. Uh, incumbent judges in that case would refuse to sign the, the order refusing bail, indicating intervention from, from their boss, their superior. So in, in some case, I mean, this, ref, this bail rejection is signed not by a judge in that case, by their superior, which is something weird because it's, I mean, usually we, we regard that only a judge who hear the case can, can give an order, can sign an order, but, but in some case, the one who signed an order is not the one who hear the case at all. So clearly there's something unconstitutional going on openly blatantly and no one care so, and criticism is punished in form of content of court at the maximum all in all i think this is thai judiciary showing signs of abusing its independence they lost their sense of accountability and there's no plausible remedies to it so the temperature is boiling about what young people want to do with the court that, that's something that we should uh, address so that what they do or what they have done so far but who are they who are these judges that i mentioned 
the for constitutional court it is more like a committee there's only one committee of nine judges and what's unique to the constitutional court is a combination that you don't have to be a career judges to sit there is a combination of professional judges from the court of justice administrative court judges from administrative court of course uh, legal and political science experts and bureaucrats in reality there's uh, there's a lot of lawyers in it but also there's some political science uh, legal scholars and ambassadors but so the constitutional court try to present itself to be above politics <clears throat> or non-political uh, non organization. But I would like to point out that non-partisanship and non-political at all are two different things. The constitutional court might be non-partisan in the sense that uh, no parties get to nominate uh, nominees to the constitutional court bench. But definitely there's something political going on through the recruiting process you know, above partisan politics into, into something much bigger. I mean, in, in the context of Thailand, there's a fight between uh, pro-election and anti-election, pro-democracy and anti-democracy is going on. That's beyond partisan politics, right? So uh, when they say it's non-political, uh, in most cases, that means uh, that institution leaning toward uh, anti-democracy or anti-election camp. Uh, so the nomination is actually very political, leaning toward conservative camp. The composition lead to an accusation, and I think quite rightly, that this is not a real court and real judges, but a political committee. I mean, several years ago, I ran, uh, I, I, we, we wrote this and co author piece on uh, colored judgment. And we look at the combination of constitutional court and we found that the only factor that determine their nomination um, is their political preference. That there's a clear uh, preference toward or against certain political camp. And this is quite uh, different from let's say the Philippines, where judges would get nomination, uh, there's more likely you get nomination if you graduate from the same school as the president or, or from the same class year. Uh, we, we find no factor or, or no factor about that, like that in, in Thai case. It seems like the only thing that matters is informal networking of the court. And that's something we poorly understand even up to nowadays. And for the court of justice, this is more conventional uh, institution. It's supposed to be more heterogeneous. You, we are talking about like thousands of people working in that particular institution. So, I mean, you could imagine that it would be easier to influence nine people on a bench rather than like an institution of, let's say, 3,000 uh, judges. But uh, and they would impose a lot of checks upon their colleagues so they couldn't act arbitrarily but uh it is not this is not the case actually given the size given the history of the court of the court of justice you would be surprised that the court bend to to those in power's wishes and, and you would wonder what happened for one thing, I would like to point out that these injustice that I mentioned earlier are not the transgression of norms. What I'm trying to say is that within the court of justice, if you are a judge and you accept a bribe, that's a transgression of norm and none of your colleagues would approve of it. They would reprimand you, they would discipline you and they would expel you. I mean, I can attest to that. But if you sign an order because your superior told you so to breach the law, to deny them bail, or to, pay, to turn blind eye to, to all this breach of constitutional right, uh, 
this is an approved behavior from the top. So indicating something beyond just mere individual uh, misconduct. All this injustice that we are talking now today are not transgression of norm. They are norms. That is an institutional norm indicating non-democratic culture within the judiciary. So this is something bigger than one crazy judge. This is the whole system. So there are several, there are three channels how to become judges in Thailand. Uh, the main one is very basic. There's a LLB, Bachelor of Law, from any accredited institution. Then two years of working experience, a, a barrister certificate and a judge examination. I mean, simple as it say, it sounds, many people spend years taking it. I mean, the chance is very slim. You Sometimes you get like up to 70,000 people taking a test and maybe like a hundred would pass it. It's not a super, it's not a super complicated, super, it's, it's not a, like a super difficult examination in one sense. It's not like an LSAT of like, you know, you, you guys take that test when you want to get to law school here in, in, in the US. It's not like LSAT, but the sheer breadth and depth of it, I mean, you have to remember all the Supreme Court decisions. So there's a lot to take in, into your brain. Uh, in form of like growth learning. So yes, it's, it's, easy. it's easy in one way that you just remember things and go to, go to take the test, but, but, uh, but because you can't think at all, you have to memorize everything. That, that makes it like super, super difficult for many people as well. Um, if you don't want to just sit there and read books all day, I mean, by book, it means like the book is full of like two or three, lies of like a noted court decision and you have to remember the whole book and there's like maybe like 18 books in total it's, it's mentally very challenging there's a small channel so it's a fast track if you get llb llm thai barrister two years of work experience and get judge examination so there's a the there's a smaller venue and you get more chance, higher chance of getting in. And there's like super fast track, a super small track. So Nam Jiu, as we say, uh, LLB and you will require two years of studying abroad. Does that explain when very peculiar trait of Thai legal students in the US, if you ask them, a lot of them get two LLM degrees. A lot of uh, law school in the US would say that they wouldn't accept anyone with like, like who have already had US law degree, LLM. But uh, it's quite common for Thai, Thai legal, Thai law student to, to try to get the second degree abroad. I mean, which doesn't really make sense, but uh, that's how it is. Two years of studying abroad. Uh, and the uh, justification is that they want someone who, who is capable of English and maybe like helping doing some research for older judges. But it's, it's accused of uh, reserve for elites, especially kids of uh, those old judges. They are, so someone said to me a few years ago that it's very easy, it's like buying your judgeship if you have 5 million baht. I mean, each LOM costs about like 2.5 million. So if you have 5 million baht, uh, that you, you get to become a judge for sure. I mean, the red used to be like 100% admission, like 100 people take a test, 100 people get passed. But now I think the red is like dropped to 60, 50. And I think that's, that's because more and more people can obtain LOM. We have a means, yeah, there are more people. So the red dropped to maybe like 50, 70%, but still much better than the main venue where like only one or 2% would pass. So there's disparity within the course. You, you get, you, in the main venue, you get certain set of people who do nothing all day, just remember the short and noted uh, court decision. 
and and you get the small channel people with LLM quality vary. Uh, sorry, I'm brutally honest here, but quality vary a lot. Uh, and you get like very posh uh, kids getting in from from uh, from that super fast track, super small uh, channel. So so there's a, a mix of things here, but but most importantly, uh, either you spend years of your time, the prime of your life uh, doing nothing all day. You spend time or you spend a lot of money to get in. And once you get in, uh, once you got in, um, you're subject to background check. And that's, that's something that we, we don't really understand what happened, uh, but it seems like somebody has been disqualified if you have expressed feel unfavorable to certain ideology. Uh, and that has a chilling effect. Uh, even down to the law school during college year, some of these kids uh, are pressured to censor themselves, to censor their opinions uh, years before the, the actual examination. Um, they don't want to leave a trace that would come back and hurt them years later. Like uh, so, uh, no political no political comment, for example. And once admitted, a judge would be given a rank. This is something very interesting. Depending, the rank is calculated upon your the years of your admission. The channel of your admission. If you come from the main, the main channel, uh, the main channel get uh, first priority, and then the small channel and super small channel. So, but even within that channel, uh, your score of examination, how well you score, and and this rank would determine your promotion throughout your career till the end of your retirement. What that means that like we call it an escalator effect. Once you are on the escalator, no one change your order. Right? You stay here, but you're gonna keep going. So it determines everything. Uh, silly as it sounds, I ask them like it determines the seating order in the training. Like you are the, the you, you rank number one, you, you get seat in the front, you rank number 200, you are in the back. And it determines the rank, even when you get food, like when you queue up for food, uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, those rank like higher gonna gonna be like ahead of the queue, and, and you have to wait at the end. Um, no, but but most importantly, it it determines your promotion. Um, everyone know that uh, those who the, the those who rank number one in that class year will eventually end up as the Supreme Court president. If you rank like number 15, sure, you will never make it to the Supreme Court president. So they say that this system is to stop any like fighting or wing ten, as we say, like, uh, uh, fighting and, and all other ugly things, lobbying for, for your own promotion. So everyone is judges on the merit of your score. Uh, but at the same time, I would say that it kills all your creativity, it kills all your incentive to work hard and to, to become better, because why bother? Because your, your, de your destiny has been decided years ago already. I always like that the first, like, the first one from the judge exam will, will, will get to, uh, to the top as a president. Yeah. So it's an escalator. And, and, and once admit, once get the rank, they would undergo six months of intense training at the Judicial uh, Training Institute. It's more like a boarding school, if you ask me. I mean, there's limited contact with non-judges friends. So that's six months. There's a lot of training about laws, about how etiquette, about manners, about code of conduct. But also there's, there's a lot of uh, quirks going on as well. There's, there's a training about how to like have a proper Western dinner, like how to use your utensil. There's a, even dancing class, even tennis class, uh, so that you can, I, I mean, it sounds outrageous, but it seems like this is from uh, the school training, like 
a colonial officer sending to somewhere far away and they have to learn how to be British, they have to learn how to play tennis, how, how to order cocktails and, and how to dance properly. Well, uh, and, and I know that some years ago, they even have like a trip to India for uh, medica meditation as part of a judge training, you have meditation. But, but all, in all, all this happened behind closed door. So no one knows exactly. I mean, I know piecemeal from friends from various uh, trainings, uh, classes. They're like, what are you doing in there? Like, uh, this and that. I mean, and there's like fancy party there. Like, what fancy party? Yes, there's fancy party. All right. Uh, that, and that's tennis. And okay, so, so you do squats and tennis and, and you guys do meditation and blah, blah, blah. So it's very interesting, actually. But uh, as long as I haven't been admitted there myself, I think my, my information would be very scant. <laughs> no, no, serious. Uh, there's a lot going on. The, the, in, the institute is very posh. It's a very posh building. And, and most importantly, they are not allowed to use their mobile phone. So we don't know. They never talk what happened in Vegas, stay in Vegas, I guess. But then they have SI posting and, and, and then they, they continue to be under a, like a chaperone of, of a senior judges for a few years before they, 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 they can fly solo. But as an, as an organization, the judiciary is very independent. There's state in the, in the constitution, the judiciary has to be independent. So there's uh, not many check and balance, I would say. Any attempt to tamper with the court will, will meet fierce resistance. So uh, the court rely principally on self-regulation, discipline by their own precedents, customs, and tradition, which is fine when you deal with an individual, but all these mechanisms fail to prevent injustice when the court itself decide to go rogue. So that's a crucial question. What makes them a royalist, a conservative and a royalist? I'm not sure what, how to use the word. I mean, now today, I don't think conservative and royalist are one and the same. I mean, a lot of royalists don't, don't seem to try to conserve anything. It seems like they want to destroy a lot of things. Anyway, so maybe that's not the same things. But uh, my basic premise, those who go to law school favor certainty of written rule over creativity. So, so that's one thing, the self-selection. I have been to both law school and school political science, and, and I noticed the difference between students in these two, in, uh, two places, uh, uh, law students, and the, the fact that they choose law, they, they favor certainty of written rules, you know, something tangible, something they can hold on to, something they want to uphold the order, um, so they don't want some messy political activities and creativity. But uh, I would like to point out here that unlike in many other cases, Thai judges are not bright or threatened to collude with the military. In other jurisdictions, you will see, you will see the autocrats pay a handsome check to, to the judiciary and they succumb to the greed. In other cases, you get strong men who will say, I will assassinate the Supreme Court president if they don't rule the case in, in the autocrat's favor. That, that's not happening in Thailand. Even the junta cannot tamper with the court independent. So we should understand the court as a comrade. I mean, the military and the judiciary should be understood as comrades bound by the same ideology and serving the same power. The military cannot threaten them to threaten judges, the military cannot order judges, but it's by ideology that guide the court what they would do in that particular situation. If there's any order, it would not come from the military. It has to come from somewhere beyond and above the military. But we may begin answering this question with legal education. 
there's a little change. There's very little change in the legal curriculum for over a hundred years. It's all about road learning of textual law, the study of juridical size in the narrow essence. So that sentence of law and how you interpret it. And or if someone means this and that, then there's, a, there's four elements before you can convict people. And, and that's pretty much it. We never discussed how this section comes into being. What's the conflicting ideas, uh, different interpretation and controversy surrounding that section? No. Uh, we we'll say this, this is a professional school, maintaining a legal professional or we'll say legal technicians to fit the legal uh, mechanism of Thailand. Like you need judges, we need lawyers, and we mean that. So virtually legal education in Thailand has no contact with other social science. Uh, a more critical uh, counterpart in political science department. We, we never aware of, uh, for example, two years ago, Tong Chai Vinit Jakun delivered a speech on Thailand's rule of law. And I think that's very touching and very powerful. It's, I think it's one of the best uh, works on Thailand's rule of law in a decade. And none of my lawyer friends have ever talked about, have ever heard about it because it's beyond law does uh, happen at the School of Economics. So we never realized that we are studying laws in the a na royalist nationalist sense that Tong Chai is saying, Raja Chan Niyom, for example. We never understood the power of and rhetoric of nations and nation state. We, we just uh, just being patriotic, patriotic, something like that. So yeah, basically it's a very profound professional school in the narrow sense. The one thing that should be mentioned about the curriculum is an absence of democracy. We never talk about democracy in the, in the law school. I don't know if that's shocking or not. We talk a lot about the rule of law, which is framed as good, and e good versus evil of upholding the law against arbitrary power of politicians. This simplistic, more understanding of rule of law versus democracy conveniently fit the heroic, heroic narrative of Thai judiciary now that they like, try to save the nation, the sinking nation from the greed and corrupt, uh, corrupt politicians, something like that. But, but I don't think that in the bigger picture uh, that would do any good to Thai politics. Another thing that missing Law students never fully understand politics either. Politics for, law, for lawyers is all about emotional, irrational games of the mass. And, and, and in comparison with law, law is a rational construct that withstands popular opinion. So, so we tend to look down on politics and we cherish law something higher, something more desirable. But this naive uh, view of politics when I come back and haunt them later because all the cases that they are tried at the moment are all political cases, highly politicized cases. And, and the more they try to, to insist that they are looking only at the law side of this conflict, the more politicized the case can become and the more politicized the court become too. <laughs> Judge examination and promotion is another big factor. As I say, it's an escalator effect. The younger, the younger you get in, the better you end up. So, Promotion is based on seniority and ranking, not merit. So it forced students to take exam at very young age. The, the youngest eligible age now is 25. The, co the constitution drafting committee once toyed with the idea of lifting it to 35 years of age. And there's a fierce resistance that even the constitution drafting committee, which is endorsed by the, 
by the junta has to back off, has to withdraw the proposal. And then that's how strong, how fierce lawyers can be when it comes to their own interest. But, but when you force people to, to take exam at a very young age, this self-selection repel those who are more critical and outspoken. The result of, of this is a cohort of young, inexperienced, conservative, susceptible to, susceptible to further indoctrination. I have to tell you a secret. Those two years of ex, like two years working experience requirement is a sham. I mean, a lot of people would get their name in, in the payroll of, uh, of, a, of a law office, but they would never, but they would never like, would never like work, like really work. They just, they just like put the name there. And uh, the requirement of doing 10 cases, um, those 10 cases are usually like very easy, like application, uh, for marriage or something so so it's something that could be end with in one day so so a lot of them are actually inexperienced and years of preparing for the exam make them ill equipped for the job market once you sit at home and read law books for exam for two years uh, no law no law firm gonna accept you gonna hire you so the only the only choice is to get judge examination and then they would dare not to break the rank because uh, they would dare not to break the rank because uh, if they are fired from, from judges, uh, from a judge, judgeship, there's nowhere to go. Uh, the skill they, they gain from uh, being a judge is not applicable in the job market elsewhere. Right. Um, so they wouldn't dare to challenge an intervention from their superiors. In turn, many of them would welcome this kind of intervention, regarding it as a kind of chaperoning or standardizing. That would be fine in normal case, I say, there must be some standard in how you make decision. Different courts make different decisions every day, so there must be some standard. But in this case, uh, when your boss tell you not to grant a bail to political activists, for example, something wrong, something very wrong is going on, but people decide not to say anything. And royalist ideology form an important part of judicial identity. You hear it all the time in the, in the court. We decide the case in the name of the king. So, so this is something like uh, an MP would boast legitimacy from the people. The government would boast legitimacy from the people. In contrast, the judge is not elected. They get legitimacy from the king. Before they begin their duty, they meet the king. They swear an oath in front of an actual king. They, they would get a chance to have an audience with the king. And, and if you walk into the court everywhere, you see the king picture and, and people keep telling you that you are Kalap Chai Tang Panetakan, servants of the king. When you walk into the courtroom, you know, it's like a mini royal audience. You have to dress properly, properly no shots, no flip flops, no uh, cross leg. You have to sit properly and don't use your mobile phone, something like that. And if you have to address a judge, the best translation is my lord. I mean, in Thai, like, that kind of endings, like, uh, in English, it would be like, address the judge as my lord. And you're looking back in the political history, you realize that how close the institution and the monarchy is. You see a lot of uh, judges, like at least three or four judges become prime minister. Sanya, Thamasak, Tanin, Gai, Vishian. There's two picks. Of course, I mean, law students are naive and they never know what Tanin did, uh, what Tanin's reputation is. They're just proud that Tanin once handpicked to be a prime minister. <laughs> uh, a lot of just go into privy council as well. So, so there's, there's a favor, royal favor to to the judiciary and the judiciary 
is very much willing to return that favor, the such loyalty. So that explain that easily explain the court's hostility to all these pro-democratic protesters, because these protesters are disloyal, are challenging the status quo, the power that be, and, and, and the world that the court is familiar with. I mean, there's a lot of unknown that I'm trying to ask. Um, for example, how much is the effect of isolation upon these judges? Uh, if you have friends who are judge, you, you realize that they don't use social media. They, they don't talk to you. They, once they, they become a judge, they have their own group and, and they stay in that group and they, they rarely uh, contact the outside world. Let me say that. Uh, how does the regime communicate? It's more complicated than the regime give order to judges. But looking at the constitutional court, for example, some cases, the judge would probably act independently, guided by their conservative ideology. But in certain cases, perhaps they're an order. But how do they communicate? Is that direct order? Is that just a hint? And, and, and people take you. We, we never know. We know that the court is biased. The court might be guided, but how? We don't know. Um, any dissent at all? Perhaps there's a lot of young judges who are sympathetic to the cause, but why don't they speak out? Or did they already speak, but, but their voice haven't been heard? There's something to be explored. But all in all, I think we are looking at a very toxic idea of independence. The court as an institution is very independent. And that gives comfort to, to many, but uh, as long as you conform to the system, um, that would be nice. That, that kind of independence and stability, that's nice. But it can be a cage too. Independence can be a cage too. It locks up many young talent judges who may want to speak out, who may want to break a rank about this injustice. But because the so-called independence. No one outside gonna come in and help them. Um, the parliament will never scrutinize the court. The government will stay away from the court. So all those who are locked up inside, those non-conformists who are locked up inside the, the judiciary are facing very hard time. My conclusion is that the judiciary is one of the last remaining public function that people still trust, albeit the trust are like diminishing every day as all these cases drag on. Uh, losing that independence, losing that trust, losing the judiciary would be catastrophic to Thai democracy and rule of law. Uh, but temperature is boiling. You know, this is not about law. Uh, as, as long as there's a law about the court, there will be a court. But uh, it, comes, it all comes down to politics of how the court would survive in the future to come. Thank you very much. Thank you for your extremely illuminating and thorough discussion of Thai juridical politics. Let me quickly introduce Ajahn Penjan Po Borisup, um, who is our discussant. Ajahn Penjan is an assistant professor of communications at the, at the California State University Fullerton. Her research areas lie in visual communications that intersects with new media technology, visual rhetoric, social justice, political activism, and environmental communication in the US and digital age Thailand. Ajahn Penjan, please proceed with your responses, which will surely open up the conversation on this important topic. Thank you very much for the introduction. And also uh, thank you, Ajahn Kim Tong, for your insightful talk. Uh, and you have elucidated uh, some of the, one of the most crucial factors of political turmoil in Thailand. Also, you examine how the Thai politics has been judicialized, how the establishment recruited judges and the operationalization of the court and the law working together to favor uh, to work in a way that favor the establishment and also the areas where education in law can be revised to include other areas of knowledge and to make it realigned with democracy and also the people. So I'm fascinated by the 
uh, description of the posh and exclusive network of judges of the same political leaning. And in this case, it's the um, leaning towards those in power or who's at the top of uh, the power in Thailand. Um, so um, you talk about how difficult it is for the, the young judges who speak up. So I'm, uh, the, the talk reminds me of the history of oppression in the Northeastern part of Thailand. So at one point, a, a few decades ago, prompted the people um, to become more interested in pursuing law and to becoming lawyers as a way to fight for justice because they've been oppressed and they've been taken advantage of, of taken advantage of and taken the resources you know to um, harvest their resources for the people uh, in, in central Thailand so do you see um, the the I have what's the word for this do you see the uh, eagerness you know to maybe infiltrate? this exclusive network of the judges or is it too too hard or too mysterious or too exclusive um, for the young you know to join and also um should i should i continue with all the the points and then you answer and you can yeah so um so the second point that I have, because I think I'm thinking of in terms of disruption and also I'm interested in dissent and activism. So I'm as, as a law professor right now in the university and the undergraduate level, do you see um, the shift of uh, the political interest among these young students? Since this is uh, kind of the generation, the fight for the gen of, of the generation that they're sharing these, like the experience that they're striving for democracy. So do you see a sort of interest in politics among these law students? And I know that you have um, shifted to the political science um, uh, department. Anyway, but um, what, what, what might be the changes you see among these young people? And also the last questions I have is, what does this camaraderie of the judges and the court lead to? when they're working together with the, the, the ideology of the establishment and continue to give the arbitrary rulings and continue to diverge from people and democracy. I'm talking about the worst case scenario and its impact on Thai society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Kim Kong, you can um address or respond to some of Jan Peng Chen's point and then we'll we will open it up to the QA. That could be addressed to uh Ajahn Peng or Jan Peng Chan. Um I think uh the eagerness to infiltrate the system actually uh yeah th this is something that very very interesting uh Jan Peng Chan. Uh I mean a judge career is I mean, at least they try to claim that uh, it's open for everyone from all walks of life, and and I mean, uh, m might not be very uh, PC, but you, you get people from Jula and Thammasat. You, you know, there's certain demography of Jula and Thammasat students, and 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 you get a bulk of uh, Ram Kamhang students and 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 other university as well. So actually, there's there's a mix of of people and. And but but the thing is, uh, I think first first of all, we we have to understand that it takes years, and 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 by taking years, very complicated. Usually, uh, it takes a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. If if my if my kids want to take a judge examination, that means I will have like one adult being unemployed and consume a lot of resources in my house for two years. Some people wouldn't be able to afford that. Some people would be able to afford it. So, so it's, uh, it excludes a lot of less well-off students from, from taking this examination already. You have to have some money, really. But, but this is something that we, we rarely talk about. Like, um, I, mean, I mean, 
they keep saying that, I mean, it's not about money if you can take a, an examination, uh, you can get in. But of course, in order to be able to, to take an exam itself, there's already a lot of money in waste. Uh, uh, that's very difficult. And, and I think it's like a lot of bureaucrats elsewhere, once they get in, a lot of them become like, you shift the status and you become a boss and, and, a, and a lot of them, I mean, they would be able to bring glory and proud and like, pride and, and financial stability to, to their family. But that doesn't mean that they would, uh, that they would uh, be aware of injustice elsewhere or try to like, be more revolutionary, more liberal. But, but of course, I mean, we poorly understand about demography of judges. We, we know something very crude, uh, male, female judges. We are having more female judges, but they are much younger because the older generation, that's all male career. We just have like first female Supreme Court president. And I'm sorry to say, I mean, uh, apart from her gender, I mean, that doesn't make any difference in, in the court. Actually, her court is quite brutal in cracking down people. But, but, but that's, that's something we know about demography, but we don't know about like which, uh, which part of the country, which region they are from, which background they are from. I mean, we, we, never, we never know how many rich kids get in, how many poor kids get in. With the small venue, we, we might get more rich kids. And I'm not sure, I, I, this, this is purely speculation, I'm not sure if the rich kid or the poor kid that get in will be more liberal or democratic. I mean, we think of those who have been oppressed like from a, a poorer region might be more like liberal or belligerent. But in many cases, uh, to our surprise, you, you would get like a, a middle-class kid who thinks more about like, uh, liberalism and, and democracy. But, but again, I mean, I have met a lot of young, bright Thai students here in the US when I study here. They talk about, I mean, I mean they sound Democrat. They sound like a left-leaning Democrats here. But when they go back home, they, they behave like a Republican. And a, a posh one, not, not the Midwest one, sorry. But, but like, you know what I mean. Uh, they, they can be liberal to the West and very conservative in the hometown as well. So uh, we, but we don't know about demography of judges. I'm saying. We, we know something, but a lot of that things we don't know. Uh, the shift of political interest, I think this is one of the greatest uh, question. You see younger generation, I think the, the picture become more contrast now. There's people who, who work as NGO, they, they work for ILAW, they work for Niti Hub. There's a, there's a small group of, lawyers that working on non-profit, uh, pro-human rights stuff, more liberal stuff. No. So there's a, I would say career choice are more varied and, and people are free to choose. But at the same time, I noticed that a lot of uh, these students now that they are second generation lawyers in the family, uh, their parents are, not, are judges or some of them are lawyers. And, and there's something with lawyers, a lot of them have complex. The reason why they become lawyers because they could they fail judge exam too many times that they have to settle as a lawyer, so they leave their dream to their kids. They force their kids. You have to take judge examination for your family. So, so you get certain group of people of students who are very energetic. They ask questions. They are aware of protests. They organize small protests by their own and. And they speak up and blah. I mean, there's a very hopeful group of students I have met. But at the same time, you, you look on the left, on, on the right side of, of your classroom and, and, and you get even a more ossified, fixed-minded kids sitting there. And some of them might, might know something about protests or two, but, but uh, they're not paying attention to. So, so actually, the, the picture is like very split right now. Yeah. Oh, the third question, um, I, can you uh, ask it a question, sorry. <laughs> I, 
question is what's going to happen if the judge the judges and the law work together to serve the ideology of the elite or the establishment what is going to lead to uh, what might be the negative what might be the impact you know to Thai society if it continues to go this way yeah so i mean as as I say, uh, as long as there's a law saying that there should be a court and this bill has to be settled in the court, you have to go to the court I mean, inevitably. But when people will begin to think of a court, like a court in North Korea or in mainland China or in, in other non-democratic countries, I mean, it's not a place where you get justice, it's a place where you get this bill sorted. I mean, somehow it has to be settled legally, but, but you wouldn't agree that the result is right. And, and I mean, there's nothing in law that is nothing, there's going to be no change in law, but I mean, in politics, that means the attitude is going to be very negative. You think of uh, France after, immediately after the French Revolution, how they think of the Court of Justice. I mean, in, in Europe, there's a big distrust of of the court of justice because like, the court often sided with the ancient regime. Um, so there are gonna be political backlash for sure, but when, I don't know, but I think uh, this is what I, I try to look for in recent years, like the, how Latin America bring their judges to justice, transitional justice, you see it in Chile, you see it in Argentina, those who colluded with the military regime are now being held accountable for their action. So, so I think this could happen in Thailand too. My biggest fear is that when it happened, it should be like properly executed and not turning into bloodbath and vengeance, uh, but, but that's, uh, that's for the future. All right, thank you, Ajahn Kim Tong, um, for the extensive discussion. We have a few questions up here. I will read about two to three. Um, so then you can collect question and answer collectively. Um, so the first one is from uh, Kun Pana Janvirod. Uh, and this is more of a comment, but I think if you have a response to it, uh, you can do it too. So uh, Kun Pana said, three major Thai universities produce most judges and legal professionals. Do the administrators see or don't care because they are illiberal? But the outcome is that they produce not judges, but bureaucrats who sit on benches and follow orders and injustice norms. So I think it's a comment about illiberalism of the system. And then second person, which is Lauren Shin, um, an interested public based in Singapore. And Lauren's asked, um, I was wondering what is the gender balance or imbalance within this system? Um, and the third question is from Eric White. And Eric is asking to follow through on the total career arc of judges. What happens to judges after they retire? Do they move on to other positions of formal, informal public authority or simply disappear into the universe of retired state bureaucrats? Right. Uh, I think I will, I will thank you for Kun Pana's comment. But, but yes, uh, if you looked, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's changing, but not fast enough. But you, you get three major universities that produce a lot of judges, uh, Jula Thammasat and, and Ram Kamhang. And other universities follow suit, but it will be some years uh, for some reason. Anyway, uh, the gender the gender balance thing I mentioned it briefly. I think we we get more female uh, recently. I think we're gonna get more and more. I mean, eventually, I think we gonna get we can have gender imbalance in in the reverse way of more female eventually. I think one thing you have to bear in mind that uh, a lot of females settle for judges uh, for judgeship because uh, there's a good choice for work life balance. A lot of lawyers in the law firm. I remember the time I have to pick up my girlfriend at 6 a.m. in the morning. 
And that's there's not one, I mean, it's not that often, but it's regular enough. It's not uncommon. Pick up your girlfriend at like three in the morning, six in the morning, and back at work at 10. So, so at one at one point they have to settle down and and have baby, have family. I mean, a lot of my law firm, I would say that none of them have kids. They would have it at like 35, so pass a lot of time. Uh, judges means why I allow you a very cozy life, good pay. They have good pay above average uh, pay for bureaucrats. And work-life balance, you get less than uh, lawyers in the law firm, but but at the same time, you get more time and, and less stress. So. And so you're gonna see a lot of gender imbalance in coming years. Right? And when they retire, and this is to Eric White, um, it depends, but judges, you may not, okay, I, I, felt I didn't mention this, but, but they retire at 70s, not 60. Yeah, so, so actually they have very long shelf life, maybe past the best before, but uh, they have very long shelf life actually. So, so uh, and beyond 70, I don't think you are capable of doing anything else, but a lot of them after 60 would go on to uh, constitutional court, administrative court. Some of them uh, go to some like committees. That's rare, but, but there's, a, there's a case, but most of them would stick to judges and, and when they retire, they just get good pension and, and that's, Pretty much it. There, there's only a few savvy one that try to go to like, but, but mostly to constitutional court and, and administrative. Um, yeah, a lot, a few of them do lectures in university, um, but, but only a handful. But, but, they, but those handful are very prominent. Right. All right, uh, let me move on with the next round of questions. The first is from Kun Kan Pong, which is a law student at Berkeley. Uh, the question is, are there any judicial reputation, incentive or pressure in Thailand's judicial system? How much does the independent nature affect this? So that's the first question. Second question from Sally Tyler. Uh, who is catching the State of the Union address by President Biden right now in DC. Uh, and she asked, Sally asked, uh, from an outsider observer perspective, it seems the Thai constitution is frequently revised based on political swings, coups, etc. How do Thai citizens view the constitution as a firm document granting immutable rights? or as a malleable treatise subject to political winds? So um, more of a reception question. And the third one um, is more of the political culture and uh, personal life of the uh, 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 ju judicial system as you mentioned. So from John Ranson, who is a graduate student at UW-Madison, the question is, could you expand a bit more on what you mentioned about judges using social media and cell phones is this a written, unwritten rule for judges? Are these judges that do not use social media, cell phones limited to certain courts? Or are they not allowed to associate with Thai citizens on social media, but allowed to associate with foreigners? Thank you. Um, for the constitutional question, can, can, can I ask Jan Penjan to give? I, I mean, I'm in, the, in a business of constitution and constitution drafting. I have my, my own view of of what I regard the constitution, but uh, I'm not sure uh, how would you perceive a constitution uh, as a right granting document or just a malleable treatise subject to political win right now? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we have so many constitutions, and then, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, I think that's your, your answer resonates with, with most ties that, that I talk to. That I mean, ideally, we, we dream of having a good constitution, but at the same time, the reality is so. What do you call it? different, <laughs> and and I mean 
I, I think we have very strong faith in the idea of constitutionalism that a good constitution would kill a lot of political ill, but, but at the same time, uh, I mean, uh, we, we don't actually trust in the actual constitution because each one that we get, I mean, looks terrible. <laughs> or made like with major flaws. With major flaws, yes. Uh, I think I agree with, with, with your answer, John. Yeah. Still, reputation, I think uh, with reputation and social media, I think that's one and the same question. It's all about how a judge should behave. And I mean, it's, I think it's now a written rule. Yes, there's a written rule about social media. So it's, it's quite broad. It, it, it would say something like you have to be careful about using social media not to harm the reputation of the institution. I mean, in, uh, I mean, Textually, there's nothing, I mean, you, you can still use social media, but uh, a lot of them would choose to like mute themselves. Uh, you know, you keep posting, one day your colleagues might want to, like, to stab you in the back, want to rat on you and to report you to the judicial committee. And, and that would be catastrophic for your, for your career. You invest so much. You, you try not to screw it up because of one stupid comment. So, so they are told, but I mean, by tradition, by custom, they are told to, like, to limit the use. And most of my friends would uh, unfriend me or just abandon their actual, like their current account and they have one with pseudonym. And, and usually they stick in, in the same group of judges. So it's an echo chamber. So that's it. So no, you should. So no one have a reputation. No one actually like if you become too famous as an individual, um, a lot of people in the court would look at you with discomfort and disapproval because um, I mean there's a strong sense of collectivism in the judiciary. You act as one, not not one like famous individual. So um, yeah, social media and judges, that's something that if you want to do a research, you get one wonderful book, not, not only like thesis, but I'm talking about book, a whole book on, on this topic, but to get an information would be nightmarish. Yeah. All right, uh, next round of question, which could be last, it depends on how long you answer it. Uh, I'll ask, speak about four questions, which I think are asking three questions. I'm reading four. Uh, first is from uh, Supatra Chao Wet, who is a former lecturer at UC Berkeley. And she asked, how does law changes in Thailand? Uh, and if the law changes in a liberal direction, would the judge enforce those law? Uh, second is from Tri Thep Si Sanga, who is a graduate student in political science at University of Florida. Um, the question is, from your presentation, it seems that the country's judicial institution is perhaps the most undemocratic among all other formal political institutions. Its roots seems to be found within the uneven and unequal social structure and culture. There might be ways to democratize the executive and the legislature, but how about the judiciary? What could be some of the ways to democratize the judiciary, which is pretty similar question to a question in the chat by Dan Roderick. Uh, the question is, we all know Thailand judiciary system needs to be completely overhauled. Lately, Thailand's rule of law has nothing to do with democracy. And since democracy is part of the judiciary system, does it mean Thai people need to wait until democracy comes to Thailand? And last question uh, in this round from Professor Catherine Bowie at UW Madison. The question is, is there any difference in the political culture of the various law schools for example, Tamasat, originally founded by Pridi, or any law schools outside of Bangkok. All right. Uh, okay, I'll try to answer something. Um, okay, there's, there's a lot to take in at the moment, but uh, talk about um, the undemocratic orientation of the judiciary is. 
is that true? I mean, not only in Thailand, but anywhere when you study judicial review and politics, I mean, it's the beginning premise. People will, will start by saying that the judiciary is undemocratic and anti-majoritarian. And, and that's true because uh, when the, you deliver a law, when you deliver judicial judgment, it, it, it doesn't depend on the majority's point of view. Right? It's about law. So, and, and the duty of the judiciary is to, to be a check upon, upon majoritarian will. So yes, that, that, that accusation, I mean, if, you, if you're a judge, you, you can't escape that. Uh, but, uh, but that doesn't mean you have to be undemocratic. You can be counter-majoritarian, you can be democratic too. I mean, people might really hate one particular decision from that court, but the support for the court as an institution might remain strong. Like, like you know, like, oh, that, that is a bad decision, but you know the court doing good, like great duty, so we decide to keep it in the system. So, so, so there can be counter-majoritarian democratic uh, orientation. It's not like uh, when you go counter-majoritarian, it means undemocratic. But, but the Thai court is undemocratic. So the, the problem is that it is undemocratic. And how to democratize it? I mean, with a lot of training. Um, but, but, but that's something that the law school has to push for. Uh, right now, the curriculum is dominated by barrister examination. So that's all, like the, the principal goal of, of legal study in Thailand is to, to, to obtain the bar. And, and everyone teach accordingly. Um, so there's no chance to like, think outside of the box and, 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 and be more creative, more critical. But, but, but you need that. I mean, uh, in Latin America, for example, um, judges after the new regime, they have to under, under, undergo training on human rights idea, democracy, and a lot of stuff. I mean, you have to put it in, in, in the training as early as possible if you want to democratize judges. It's too late if you want to de democratize judges in the institution, in the judiciary. The, the identity is already set. Uh, but of course, I mean, with knowledge from, from some of our unknown things like uh, demography, for example, people ask I me, mean, if you know that, um, if you can change demography, if you can change uh, judge requirement, you know, lifting the age up to 35, forcing them to work a few years um, and learning, the, getting a sense of reality, uh, that would make them more independent and, uh, and their boss couldn't dominate them as is. Well, uh, political culture of various law schools, I think perhaps yes and no. Uh, Tamasad often get reputation as like very liberal, but if you look into the faculty body, actually there's only a few lecturers who are outliers, who are liberal. And a lot of them are very much traditional, like very conventional uh, law professors. Of course, it's, it's changing, I mean, with the new dean, uh, but, but you have to understand it's, it's more subtle and incremental than, than, than what we used to think of Tamasa. Uh, but anyway, credit goes to them. I mean, they are now pushing for reform of legal curriculum in Thailand to, to be more inclusive of other social science ideas. So, so yes, there's political cultures there, although I'm not sure how how much different they are. I mean, in terms of outcomes, Tamasat has like 700 students. So naturally you get, you get people to go on to do a lot of things, various things. July has 200 students per class year. Tamasat has seven, 700, 800 per year. So, so, so it's naturally you get Tamasat everywhere doing like liberal stuff, doing non-liberal stuff like that. Uh, it's just a larger pool of students. Um, so yes, a, a law change would be nice, but I think you have to change the, the judicial culture first in the law school, in the court. Yeah, I think uh, our time is running up. So my apologies to um, uh, James Weiss and uh, Kun Napason for not 
uh, reading your questions, but uh, we are getting the time. So uh, thank you uh, for a thought provoking discussion and uh, all the illuminating replies to all the challenging questions. Um, as it is in Zoom, uh, we have to imagine, I, I like to end with this uh, <laughs> round of applause uh, to Ajahn Kem Tong and Ajahn Penjan. And if Sarah doesn't have any other announcement, we'll be officially, officially ending this webinar. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me and, and for those who want to continue the discussion, I think you can reach me by email and I'm willing to, to discuss further. So thank you for in, inviting me here. Very enjoyable morning for me. It's only 9.30 in Bangkok. My apologies. It's time for us to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs>